make sure you have a strong enough foundation in your own desires to come back to yourself no matter what information comes into you and make a judgment call based on what you really what feels right to you because if i had followed the shoulds in my life of all the things i thought i should do i would never have this incredible man he has grown me in ways that i can't even articulate You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast, hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Almost 30 started as a conversation about the transition from our 20s to our 30s. But then we realized life is full of transitions. So we expanded our mission. We are an intuition-led, wellness-focused lifestyle podcast that promises to deliver authentic conversations, diverse points of view, and insights rooted in optimism, growth, and intention. The Almost 30 Nation community is a group of purposeful dreamers who are smart, passionate, and always seeking the full potential in every aspect of their lives. At Almost 30, we're making magic together. We dream it, and then we do it. Thanks so much for tuning into the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. What's up, guys? (laughs) Welcome back to Almost 30 Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. So glad, truly. (laughs) I'm Lindsay Simpson. You're keeping the lights on. This is Krista Williams. And we are best friends and also business partners and started the business at the same time that we were starting our friendship, Mm -hmm. which was awesome. But we started this podcast when we were transitioning from our 20s to our 30s. And it's just become so much more than that. We realized everyone's going through some sort of transition. So we wanted to have insightful, funny, honest conversations between each other with you all and with guests that we bring on the podcast about everything from health and wellness to spirituality, sexuality, culture, relationships, entrepreneurship, all the things. They're really smart and they're really fucking funny. (laughs) (laughs) I know we we heard that you guys missed that part of the intro. I did too. Yeah, I liked it. Vibes. I thought that we had to, I don't know, not mature, but... Be more inclusive of the impact of the community. That was really my our totally our the impetus for the change. So we had an old intro which was bomb, and which mm-hmm. is the intro now for a bunch of other podcasts because <laughs> they took our took our intro and changed words, <laughs> changed like, like just one word. Uh, so we free speech, I suppose. Yeah, truly, <laughs> twenty nineteen. So we evolved our intro, and we just wanted to make sure that we captured the most important part of this podcast, which is the community and the people that listen and the Facebook group and our Instagram family and the people that we meet on tour and the people that are meeting without us and the people that are doing good things in the name of the Almost 30 brand. Yeah. It's... uh, it's I know you didn't ask, but that's why. It's changed everything (laughs) for us, truly. And we are actually on tour now. We are on tour all year. We are in London and we're off to Denver at the end of May. We will be in San Francisco in July. And then the fall is quite... Fall and winter quite the uh, marathon yeah. of, of cities we are so excited to visit. So like Chicago, Nashville, Ohio, uh, Washington, D.C., Philly, Miami, back to L.A., all yeah. the things. And as a highlight, so the Denver event happening on May 30th is with Natalie Miles. That is going to be about tapping into your intuition. It is at a beautiful space called Green Spaces in Denver that will sell out. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there. And then in following to that, we have an event on June 20th in LA with Brie Melanson. Mm-hmm. So that is a breathwork class. If you guys have never tried breathwork, this is great for you. If you are a veteran, this is great for you. We are hosting that at We Work in Culver City. And then the one in July is with Lacey Phillips. So if you have been impacted by the Lacey Phillips podcast that we have done with her, we have three. They've been one of our most popular podcasts and the work that she has done in the manifestation space with To Be Magnetic is so impactful. So we're doing a live show with her Mm -hmm. in July in San Francisco on the 27th. And we would love to see you there. Tickets are available on our website. And then right after that, or before that actually, is our retreat. Mm -hmm. So that is the highlight right now. We have a retreat happening on the 9th through the 12th of July at Calamigos Ranch in Malibu, which is Restoration Hardware meets Malibu Chic. It is the most beautiful place I've ever been. There are trees, there are pools, there are 
everything you need to take the best Instagram, but also to deconnect <laughs> um, if that is what you want. We are going to be doing Reiki healings, sound baths, astrology readings, workout classes, connection, relationship courses, and workshops, and all of the things. It's basically everything that me and Lindsay love about retreats and events that we attend all combined into one and inviting our favorite people to speak. Yeah, exactly. And we've experienced so much in LA and met so many incredible practitioners, healers, fitness experts, all the things. So we wanted to in- invite them and create this experience for you that we've been you know, immersed in for quite some time now since living in LA. And we just can't wait to spend time with you. So it'll be an intimate, beautiful, nourishing retreat that we hope you can come to. So um, spots for that are available now on our website. So take a look and almost30podcast.com under the main menu. Just click on retreat 2019. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about this because I was listening to today. So I took a walk today in the park and I listened to Rich Roll, which I haven't. Rich Roll is one of my OGs. Mm -hmm. Um, The Rich Roll podcast. When I first started listening to podcasts years and years ago, he was one of my first. And I really admire his, how humble he is, his vocabulary, the diversity of his guests. Today, he had on a woman named Lisa Day Moore. So it's D-A-M-O-U-R. She's a PhD and she actually studies teenage children. So teenage girls and teenage boys. And what I really loved is the conversation around how to be a better parent to those teenage girls and boys, especially in the day of social media, in the day of phones, in the day of things that are going on in the world that you know we didn't experience. Um, related to bullying and all of these things. And she was talking about something that was really interesting related to uh, girls and boys when they're growing up, that biologically, there's no difference between, you know, males and females in the sense that when teenage girls go to high school and they develop these deep relationships with other females that are very open and conversationary, um, and you're sharing all these things, you know, in high school and, and middle school, you probably had really deep relationships where you told them everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas men in this case don't necessarily turn to other men, they more turn to distract. So the women seek community with other women. And in this case, they may get hurt. You know, it may be hard because they're experiencing drama because they've shared things and because they've gotten deep. But men, on the other hand, uh, seek to distract. So that is why they're playing video games. You know, they may go to pornography. They may go to um, isolation. But it just really spoke to the fact that all of these things that an idea, all of these ideas that we have related to teenage boys and teenage girls are all socialized. So we could socialize men, on the other hand, to be more open, to be more vulnerable, to communicate more, to lean on other men their age more. And then on the other hand, we could communicate to women to be more independent, you know, be more free thinking, um, all of these things. But it really struck me because the relationship of women or the women in seventh and eighth grade and even in high school, it is such a pivotal time for those Mm -hmm. deep friendships and how you can get really hurt by them, you know, because you are exposing yourself so much and sharing so much. And I do remember never seeing men On the other hand, really having those deep friendships. You know, I definitely think that they had super deep, meaningful friendships that still stand today. Most of the the men that I've dated in my life have had very longstanding friendships since high school and middle school and all those things. But it never felt like as deep as the ones that the women were having. And it was nice to really hear that brought to light and discussed. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to think about like how that time is so pivotal and, you know, if it goes awry at one point or another, like how, like for me, I sought refuge in the, the way in which boys kind of didn't have those deep relationships because, you know, then I wouldn't get hurt, you know, like it was then, yeah, it was, it it was interesting. It, It, because now I'm having to do some, reprogramming around like how I show up to friendships. Cause for me, I, yes, I had, I have and had some incredibly deep, beautiful friendships, but I do think that time in middle school, early high school was like a bit fucked up and like kind of trained me to not go as deep or show up fully because of the hurt that it, I did that. And then there was hurt there. And then now I feel unsafe to do that. So that's still in my body. And I'm kind of trying to, you know, 
resensitize myself to all of that. But that's so interesting. Yeah, I think about like how are schools playing a part in that? Like how are schools creating an environment where, you know, instead of fucking free period or whatever the hell or like some weird class, like maybe it's like a sharing circle. Maybe it's like almost almost like therapy, like group therapy in school. You know, I don't know if that's legal, <laughs> but like yeah. just like creating an environment where both men and women feel like they... And it, I, I would assume it would have to be separated. So females are with females, males with males, but like where they can feel comfortable enough to share. And hopefully that would translate at home. They would share more at home and hopefully that would translate into the next relationship they had and so on and so forth. But yeah, I think there's a responsibility in the schools if that's where they are for a majority of the time. Yeah. And it was interesting too, because a lot of the data speaks to the fact that this is the best behaved generation yet. So less kids are getting in trouble. Less kids are having sex, less kids are doing drugs, less kids are binge drinking, Mm. which is interesting because it speaks a lot to, you know, the media's perception of things. And I remember when we were in uh, Costa Rica, they talked about that, how this day and age is less violent. um, There's less war, Mm. there's less death due to sickness. So there's less of these things happening. But if you turn on the media and you are part of the media cycle, you may not believe that and you may not see that. So it was interesting too, because a lot of that is attributed to uh, technology and cell phone use. So on the one hand where technology has provided, you know, a disconnection to others, to community, to um, your body, all of these things that, you know, we very well know are negative. The impacts of social media are mostly, you know, negative on growing children or growing boys and girls. But there is a lot of it that speaks to the fact that it is positive. You know, if teens are having less unsafe or un- sex in that way, mm-hmm. it's interesting. Or doing less binge drinking or doing less, you know, opioids or different types of drugs. Mm-hmm. So it's just such a fine line, but that podcast was really good. It was on Ritual. And it was interesting to hear her talk about how to have these conversations with your kids. And a lot of it is the demonstration. And a lot of it is the vulnerability and the clarity around why you're doing what you're doing. And the one thing she did say is staying consistent, is staying consistent with your messaging, staying consistent with your values, staying consistent with your methods of punishment, Yeah, you know, in quotes, whatever that is. But it just reminded me again that I have such hope in the next generation. And I have such hope that the growing consciousness that we're all seeing, you know, really is magnified with them and what they're doing. And that we now have the tools and the ability to kind of see over time how these trends with boys and girls work and then maybe to work against them so that they can have a better chance, you know, maybe than we did and maybe definitely when our parents did and the parents sure. before that. Sure. Yeah. And I have hope for like our generation becoming parents, like if we're lucky enough to become parents and to be able to be as honest in our processes and also as consistent in our in our ways in which we teach as, you know, as best we can. Yeah, the consistency is an interesting thing because I can imagine that kids, you know, are always thinking, well, why? Because as, as little, little toddlers, the question was, but why? But why? But why? And that just like translates as you get older and they're kind of trying to track like, but that doesn't make sense. Like the inconsistency confuses them, frustrates them, and then they act out. So whether it's lying or, you know, doing whatever, it's an interesting thing to track. But if you're just honest with them, they understand exactly why you're doing this, uh, you know, in response to what they did, then they can just connect the dots a bit easier and get less frustrated. Because sometimes they don't know why they're frustrated. They just know that like, this isn't making sense. Like, you know, I must be stupid. And then they revert to whatever behavior. But I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And I think you don't want to stop the but why. You know, I say... Totally. But why to everything today. Totally. And that's one of my, you know, one of my favorite things about living. (laughs) But it's a conversation. It's like, but why? And you tell them. Yeah. But why? And you tell them. It's not like, don't ask me why, just do it. It's, but why? And you tell them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. So that one was good. Rich roll. Um, You can listen to that. Maybe we'll have her on the podcast just because I really, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's something I don't think about. You know, I don't have kids right now. Um, I don't have a teenager, but 
I just like to learn about everything like that because it does also help you understand yourself. Yeah, for sure. You know, sure. of course, and that's the goal for most people is to understand themselves. So in these conversations about parenting, about raising kids, about raising teenagers, if you're listening and you're a female, you probably have been a teenager once. So it helps you understand um, a lot about what you were doing better. Yeah. And there's a still a teenager inside of you. Mm-hmm. Like for sure. Yeah. She's pissed. She's pissed. She's listening to Avril Lavigne and she's in her room. <laughs> Ground into her pillow. Yeah, honestly. Um, and her phone is hurting her ear. Oh my God. Remember those days like, when you I would fall asleep ears. with your boyfriend on the phone and you'd Remember be there you... crying or laughing and then you'd just like fall asleep and it'd be like beep, beep, beep. Yeah. And you'd be like, let me switch ears and you'd switch <laughs> over. Or you'd have the cell phones from Limited too that were like see-through. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Those were sick. So many. I, I And the blow-up chairs and like... Everything was see-through. Everything was see-through with glitter. Totally. <laughs> I was like, all right. My For mom's like, sure. Mm-hmm. This is ugly, but sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but same with, you know, the conversation we have, you know, today for you all with Danica Brescia and Billy Haley, you know, it makes me think about that too, where, you know, this might not apply directly to you, but the way in which you know, they have found the honesty in the relationship, ways to create space in the relationship, you know, even the infidelity part, just thinking more about, you know, the gut instincts that Danica had around that behavior. I do think there's going to be things that all of you can take away. Yeah. It was, it's really beautiful, you know, and I feel really thankful that Danica chose Almost 30 to be the first place that she is having the open conversation about her relationship with Billy and the status that they have now. If you guys remember when we first talked to her, she wasn't with him. So if Mm -hmm. you go back very far, she wasn't with him. But in between that time, she did a tour of the United States to 66 stops uh, for her brunch series. And within that, her and Billy had an RV. They cooked at all these beautiful homes. They helped women with their self-care routines. Um, They grew very close. They fell in love. At the end of it, you know, they decided to do conscious uncoupling and to take a break. And within that time, you know, things changed and and Billy had um, issues with relapse. He's been a very open and honest addict throughout their entire relationship and even at the beginning and through the Brunch Series tour. So he had um, issues with that at the end and they are able to continue on their relationship in the way that works for them in an open way where they are communicating very honestly, where they are not hiding anything, where they are still in each other's lives and they are still supporting each other and seeing each other grow. And it is an amazing thing. So this conversation happens during the process. Mm -hmm. This isn't at the end. This isn't a happy ending. This isn't a sad ending. It is during in the middle of a process. So if you're in a relationship, if you're with someone who's an addict, if you're in Um, a situation where you love someone, but you don't know if it's best to be together and you're trying to explore it, or you're in love with someone and um, you think it's best to be together, but you just don't know how, this conversation is perfect for you. If you are a Danica Brescia fan, this conversation is extra perfect for you. (laughs) We are huge fans of hers and we are happy to have this honest and raw conversation with her and Billy and share it with you. Yeah, totally. And there was also a piece that was intriguing to me because anytime things happen within a romantic relationship, you know, there is repercussions with family and friends as to like maybe judgment, they care about you. So it it just kind of adds a layer of like, you know, discomfort or something you have to think about, you know? So that was really interesting to talk to her about. But yeah, and I just think of this as, you know, your relationships in your life are one of the biggest pieces of your self-care. So creating the boundaries in relationship, really having that open and honest communication with that person. And it does affect your health. You know, like overall, it definitely affects your health. So this is something that I think is really important for all of you to hear. It's in real time and super, super honest and raw. So thank you again to Danica and Billy for being so honest and sharing your story. And we love you. So listen to this episode if you love it, it resonates with you. Or if you want to share it with someone, you can share on Instagram, text it to a friend, whatever it is. We always appreciate it. And join the secret Facebook group. We'll talk more about it in there. See you on tour. We love you. Love you. (laughs) Enjoy. Bye. (laughs) 
So wait, did you start tour or did you guys meet and then you guys were like, let's do tour? I definitely swipe right. What do you did? What do you got a question? So wait, did you you guys met and then you're like, let's go on a tour? Or did you say I want to go on yeah, a I tour just, and then you saw him on Tinder and I said, let's go on tour. No. <laughs> do you want to go? No, ben? go ahead, get it, get it. Okay. So <laughs> we met on Tinder in November of yeah, twenty. I remember. Sixteen. This lifetime, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's sweet. I was living in my parents' garage. Billy was in sober living. Yes, I was. We had a lot going for us at the time. Are no. you going to date in sober living? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's not recommended. For I mean, because sure. you should focus on yourself. But, yeah. um, but I here was, we are. <laughs> I, I throw the rules out the window for her. You're going to so. be with anyone. <laughs> right? You're going to yeah. be with Angel Danica Brescia. Right. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Okay. So, um, yeah, we we were dating for quite some time. And, and Billy's been a chef for 15 years and thought, um, and I have used a lot of self-care tools to transform my life, manifesting and all that sort of stuff. And I thought I I really wanted to share that with people. And so we thought, well, we'd love the idea of working together and having sort of a little more freedom to our work life rather than Billy working at a restaurant and crazy hours or whatever, you know, and just, so we decided to put a little event together and hosted it in our yard. Well, in all fairness, like I, I watched her like cultivate this idea over three days on a weekend a little on a computer and she just visualized from start to finish. And we walked into the weekend just kind of like, Oh, let's, let's, let's have a good weekend together. And we walked out with a tour and she did this all in three days, like start to finish and conceptualize it and put it all together. And it was like, it's pretty amazing to see yeah. somebody like big picture like and then go get it. For mm. sure. It was a, it was a like it's a quite download. the experience. Yeah. So we just, we did a few events in January at our house. Well, the first one sold out in like six hours. I so remember we, when it was in here. Yeah. So we did them in Southern California. We did three in January, six in February, five in March. And we saw a lot of people flying out or driving out every month for the events. And we had, thought about more of like a minimalistic nomadic lifestyle and thought we wanted to give it a try. And so it was going to be a two month tour and we put something out (laughs) to see if people wanted to host one of our events at their home. And we had 160 people (laughs) submit their homes. We were like, Oh, okay, cool. Wow. Are you guys getting ideas for venue? No, (laughs) no. (laughs) Because then it's pressure. (laughs) Yeah. It's a lot. It was a lot. And then I come to their house and I'm like, can we turn up the lights a little bit? And can we put on a diffuser? And can we <laughs> right, and can I bring flowers over here? And they're like, this is my house, bitch. Yeah. Do, you mind, do you mind if we bring our 220 pound dog? Yeah, yeah. that's oh, real. Yes. That was part of the contract. Totally. But so we, we were just blown away by, with the amount of people who were generous enough to welcome us for something like that. And we plotted it all out and yeah. realized that if we were going to do a tour with any sense of self-care and wellness, that it was going to be a lot, lot longer than two months. So it ended up being eight and a half months mm. total in 2018. We did 66 events. Whoa. I can't believe that. So <laughs> yes. what's the Honestly. math on that? Yeah. What is that? Like, do you do a couple events? So 66 cities? 66 events. events. Most cities were one event. Some okay. cities we'd do two. So like a bigger city, we'd do Saturday, Sunday. How would... You, so you were, you had an RV. We didn't start with an RV. No, we started with a Jeep and, and a, an equipment trailer. It was way too heavy for my Jeep. I didn't do that kind of research. Did you stay in hotels? Airbnb. Okay. Yeah. Which was hard to find with a 220 pound dog. Wow. I haven't even mentioned. thought about that. It was a lot. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and we stayed. And then eventually we... Um, we just got tired of moving our stuff, not just in and out of people's houses for these events, but yeah. in and out of different Airbnbs all the time. It was just the, the level of groundedness was at a yeah, negative. It, it never yeah. felt like we had a, a sense of a home, you know, like our little spot. We always had to set up our spot in somebody else's place and then break it down, clean it up, and then go pack an event, set up an event, break it. And nothing was ours. Yeah. And then that's hard not to have like a sense of home. And for like someone in recovery, was that... Uh, nomadic lifestyle helpful for you to be so busy, to be so on the go? Or was it like stressful where you were like, what was that like for you mentally? Uh, I mean, the, the place I was in, like I made Danica my higher power, right? Mm-hmm. So she, keeping her and what she wanted to do and, and her life in that spot secured my my safety, like my, my security, my everything was her all of a sudden. Uh, and I thought that was okay. And so, um, I mean, it, it was hard. You, you go from being super connected around men that have like accountability and you have a circle and you have this process and uh, you have a routine. And then just uh, essentially I got a resentment and then I said, you know, screw it. I'm going to go with her. And she became my higher power. And so she was my program. What's a resentment? Mm. Uh, resentment. Um, I don't know how to really define it other than like uh, I'm upset or angry at somebody yeah. for something, you know? Uh, so I said, you know, screw you. I'm out, you know, mm-hmm. never having to look at myself for that. You know, it's your fault, not mine. Uh, Right and like an escape. Yeah, like just a resentment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Danica, how did that feel for you? Did you feel that he kind of put you there as that higher power? So all of this, we eventually moved into the an RV. We got an RV and then we spent the, the next seven months living in the RV together, which we actually loved. I mean, I think we yeah. do really well close to each other. A, a lot of realizations about our dynamic and the codependency coming from both sides and all that came from these last few months since we've been back from the tour. So I don't think at the time I realized it. I was just like, dude, this guy is all about serving me across the board. And he is just like, what a, you know, you, you see him as this man and man who is so helpful and so caring and loving and vulnerable. And, you know, for me, I was like, damn, you know, I've never been in a super serious relationship before. And so I didn't know any different. So the way that he served me, I thought that was just like a really beautiful partnership. And for me as an entrepreneur, I thought, oh, okay, this is like that balance. Yeah, he that. Does, you know what I mean? It's it's unique. Sometimes you need it. And what Billy does, and I always say, is Billy took on the role of doing so many of the thankless things that I got a lot of credit for. And so I'm on the front and people see, oh, you're doing all of these things. But they didn't see necessarily how he holds me emotionally every single night when I'm stressed out or I'm burnt out or he does the dishes and takes care of the dog and cleans, you know. Or set up the event and take down uh, yeah, all the yeah, chairs and the tables. That. That. That yeah. That that yeah, so, big job. Um, <laughs> so we didn't, I didn't realize until probably after, and Billy can tell you kind of a little more of this, how we got to where we are now and um, as it relates to him. But I didn't realize until we both sort of jumped back into recovery and back into these conscious conversations when we got back from the tour and life, we actually made space to think rather than being in the hamster wheel all the time. When you're busy all the time, there's no reflection. There's no pause. There's no introspection. You're just doing, 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 and there's no space for being. And that was kind of what the tour was. So I think things, had we been going slower, maybe we could have slowed down and, and realized that things were maybe a little stickier or not so consistent or routines were suffering but we didn't realize until we got back. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Right? Your, your normal is your normal uh, until you have to remove yourself from that and go, oh, that's why. Mm-hmm. Oh, I get it now. But, I, you know, it takes a lot. Yeah. What about from- the codependency? Like, where did you discover that that's what that was? And can you define it for our audience? Mm. Well, do you want to share what? sort of this path of, well, I guess with codependency. It, it's pretty yeah. new. Like, honestly, yeah. the last couple of months is just when we, started looking back at everything and going, oh, now this makes sense. You know, I was kind of, I was, wasn't was forced to get sober again, but I, I definitely relapsed when I first met Danica briefly. And then through the tour, like that was, you know, uh, every now and again, and it just, it just grew, you know, I'm, I'm an addict. So if mm-hmm. I, it makes me feel better and makes me not feel, I want more of it and um, definitely made those mistakes. But a lot of the behavior in our, in our relationship came from my addiction, you know, mm-hmm. and then her, our dynamics were shaped by that. Right. And so everything I was doing was don't look at the real me. I don't want to lose you because if you see the real me, you're going to leave. Right. And so here, let me put this on. But, yeah. you know, and that's, that's the hard part. And then so she got used to that dynamic. This is how we were. Right. I was this way. She was this way. And then coming back in, you know, a couple months clean, sober, and we're talking about a relationship and it's different. What do you mean it's different? You, you, I'm used to you being like this. I'm used to you giving me this. I'm used to giving, me, well, that's not healthy for me. Right. So what is that? And then we had to look at, oh, this is where we codependent, what's going on. Our our dynamic had totally shifted because a healthy version of me puts me first, you know, without me being put first, I don't get her, ah, but yeah. we can't interact the same way because a lot of that dynamic is, is codependent. It's depend, I, I depend on her to feel okay inside. She depends on me to feel okay inside. And that's not healthy, mm-hmm. right? Anything you need on the outside of you to be put inside to feel okay, that's not okay. You know? So this word codependency became, it's totally new for me because in my head, I'm like, I'm a financial independent businesswoman. I am doing my thing, you know? And, um, and, and, you know, what, what kind of happens over the course of the two, you know, we've been together now two and a half years, right off the bat, Billy said, this is me. And that was the thing that I was so attracted to. He said, I'm, you know, I'm in recovery. I'm a drug addict. I'm, you know, this and this and this, I've had these felonies. I've had, he, you know, he shared all of himself. And for me, that was the most attractive thing to see a man be vulnerable, to see a man be honest. And I, and, and we built a trust. Mm-hmm. And so over the course of our relationship, there were a couple slip ups where I, you know, he smoked pot, right. Or, and, and, didn't, and hit that or something, or there was some, you know, just, just a couple of these different kinds of slip ups and trust started getting diluted because I lost my trust then. 
Okay. And then I lost my trust again. And our trust got lower and lower and lower until it kind of created a really unhealthy balance. So by the end of the tour, because my gut, my instincts were going off all the time. And it doesn't mean they were right every single time, but they were a lot. (laughs) 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 But it it really did a number on our trust. And we just finally were like, we need space. We we need some space. We went to Mexico and it just ended up being like, not the funnest trip. Not the best. Classic. Those those I know. I love that are volatile. Oh my God. Fighting vacation. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Especially one where they sell drugs over the counter. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, My bad. The pharmacy. My bad guys. Yeah. (laughs) Um, that was my so fault. anyway, you know, we've been navigating this and we live pretty publicly. We've been in the public eye and, um, it's just one of those things that you can't, you have to give yourself space mm-hmm. and it's changed a lot of dynamics for that piece of, <laughs> I know for me, for my career, but it's been one of the most beautiful things. So the trust sort of went away and eventually we got back and it came to this culmination, this kind of head where he was like, I'm detoxing. And I was under the impression mm. that he was detoxing from like mm. not hard drugs. I didn't know <laughs> until four yeah. months, three months ago that he had actually relapsed on heroin oh, oh, fentanyl. And, and fentanyl. Yeah, and it's strong on opiates. No, uh, uh, or, yeah, it's, it's always been opiates for me. I, I've yeah. been drinking in a long time. That that was the thing for me that um, allowed me not to feel. Once and, you go yeah. opiates, you never go back. Well, it's hard because I think a lot of, <laughs> it's true. I think a lot of people associate the feeling of opiates with love. Yeah. It, it's very, mm. it, it feels uh, very similar wow. and it, it, it's That's also consistent. You know, so if you yeah. don't have love and you don't have consistency in your life, that I know how that makes me feel, and it never fails. Yeah, until it does, you know. Yeah. So, did you? Was it on tour that you were slipping up? Or oh, where bef- were you finding bef- before then? Okay. I mean, like, first of all, if if you if you're an, if you're an addict or an alcoholic, like, doesn't you can put us in any city in the world, yeah. and and I and I find what I need. That's just how that that's um, I'm attuned. I, I'm yeah. attuned that way. I, yeah. I I seek what I want. You know. Yeah. Um. That's why I'm here with her. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's anywhere, you yeah. know, and. and I, you can only try to control it so hard because I had to keep up this front for her, right? She can't see how broken I am. She can't see how much pain I'm in, right? Because then she'll leave me. And if she leaves me, then what What does that make me, right? Uh, so, I mean, just trying to keep that hustle on top of doing a tour, on top of trying to keep up this personality that when she met me, like I was this person and I was that person. And then I stopped being that person and I had to fake it. And that's always really hard, you know, because right. I think... I was going to say addiction looks very, you, addiction seems very different until you're in it. People are like, how do you not know? Billy is someone, it's not like when he was using, he wasn't showing up. It was, he, it's not like he wasn't doing his job and like he wasn't laying around all day. He wasn't, he would, you know, maybe my instincts went off a little bit. Mm-hmm. But other than that, he was function. He was doing what he said he was going to do across the board, except for using, you yeah. know? So, yeah. so it's, it looks very different when you're in it than when you're, um, than what you think it might not, like look like, and I've been going to Al Anon now, and it is which is a program for people who have friends and lo- or loved ones, family in recovery, and I'm learning so much, and I'm in this new space where this word codependency and ego, and what you realize what Al Anon is is it's actually a program for you, for me. It, it's not about mm. the qualifier. You know, it's not mm-hmm. about the person that got you in there. It's about looking at your own role because in my perspective, for most of the time, I thought, oh, Billy's using, that's him. It's all his fault. That's all him. I have nothing to do with that. Some people in those relationships do blame themselves. It's all, everyone's situation is different. But for me, I was, I, I just saw he's broken. I want to help him. I want to help fix him, but I, I can't. And I also don't want to get dragged down with it. So how do I create healthy distance? Which is why for a while we had, we were trying to navigate this space and this gray area, but we're so in love. So it was this sort of, it was a very confusing space to be Mm -hmm. in. Was there ever any time, because you have your brand, Mm -hmm. Danica Brescia, Mm -hmm. and then there's Model Meals. And I'm just wondering, like, were you ever resentful for like kind of what was going on as it relates to your business? Because I think like, you know, we we are in our masculine so often mm-hmm. just like running the business, making mm-hmm. sure everything is running smoothly. Mm-hmm. So to, to have that compassion and slip into that feminine, I don't know how easy that is. So what was that mm-hmm. like? Mm-hmm. You know, we have separated in terms of model meals. That's we've kept that separate intentionally. My, my business partner and I had a conversation when I met Billy, cause I love him and he's an incredible chef. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. Super fun. So we kept that separate. So it's been, that's been separate, but I think, What's what's hard is um, what was hard is I'm so used to sharing 
my life. And not because I feel like I have to, just because it's natural and it feels good to me and I connect. But when someone else is involved, you also you have to be really cautious of their own, of giving them privacy and space because it's not all mine to share. Me sharing how I'm feeling without him, and it's not my my. I can't tell. I can't do that. That's not fair, mm-hmm. you know. And so what I will say is, Billy is an incredibly conscious man. the The way that he can talk about feelings and emotions and consciousness and these, and so never, you know, always in our relationship, he is. The the addict is has enough shame and they're beating themselves up enough. Like they don't need other people doing it. Mm-hmm. They're already, I mean, and you can speak to this more than I can, but he's so conscious and he, it's so beautiful. And so what it turned into was this beautiful lesson for me of, of keeping things, of going through things on my own. And the truth is it's pulled me away from social media a lot, but it's exactly where I needed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're I always think about that. It's like your perception of the situation isn't his truth. Right. You know, how you perceive whatever mm-hmm. things going on isn't the actual his truth of what he's experiencing. And it's interesting about the Al Anon that you brought up is I remember when um we had Adi Jaffe and Sophie Jaffe on. They're amazing. Um them. the best, number one. Uh and they talked a lot about she talked a lot about her role and her active participation in his sex addict in him being a sex addict, in him being a former addict and how when she finally took, not responsibility necessarily, but a look at herself in the mirror and how she was participating in the situation, like everything changed. Everything changed for her. Everything changed for him. I'm curious about a time when you had an intuitive hit about something going on and it was confirmed right. Mm. Which one? I know. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Which one do you want to talk about? I guess that's what I'm thinking. Which one do you think? Oh, I guess we done the list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then with her intuition, were you like, no, that's not true? Like, because sometimes you you know the immediate reaction for someone if they're yeah. accused is to deny, no matter what. If you're like, hey, you did this, you're like, oh no. Right. Even if it's true, and a minute later you're like, yeah, it is true. Your immediate reaction is to defense. Did you deny every time, and you were like, no, 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 or? Oh, what was that like? Absolutely not. I'm always on the defensive because I'm always in the wrong. Yeah. Like I'm never transparent about my behavior or my activities. A lot of people right? aren't. For sure. But it, it, you know, this this is the funny thing with Danica is, uh, you know, we had this conversation uh, about a month, a month or two ago. And, you know, she had said, if you, if you wanted to use, you can use. Just you should have told me about it. You're an adult. You could do what you want to do, you know. Um, and she would have more accepted that honesty than me lying about it. So I could have came to her and said, you know, hey. I'm really over the sobriety shit. I, I I just want to get high right now, but I want you to know what I'm doing and this is what I'm going to do. And that she could accept that and then decide how she feels about that. And, and, but that, that action is going to have consequences. You know, I thought if she saw the fact that I, I wanted to do that, or I wanted to not feel that she was going to judge me and all they're going to see how broken I am, then she's going to leave anyway. So I might as well not tell anybody and save, you know, the, the whole shame and guilt over it because I know it's a wrong action, right. you know? And, um, but I, I never, had anybody to trust in my? I mean, I, 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 I she has the most trust I have in, in, in anybody in this world, and even then, it's still everything's suspect to me because I can't believe that you actually give a shit about me, right? right. You really don't because the world's that way. Um, but uh, she does, and so yeah, you know, it's yeah. yeah. I think the moment what you're asking, the moment that came to my mind is when, and this is probably about three months ago. Which one? It was right before you got sober when yeah. he had stayed over at my house. We So we had taken like a month where oh, we didn't. Bad day. Where we, we had taken like a month <laughs> where we didn't talk. No, so we came back from the no tour. Good. We went to Mexico. No good. And I went to Mexico and my, my intention was I want space. <laughs> I want clarity on what I want to do next in my career and next yeah. in my life, right? And the clarity that I got was that we really needed some space yes. because things weren't working the way that we were doing things. And so that became this entire trip was this conversation. And I'm so grateful because I had planned to, to get off social media for a week and do all that. So it really gave us this week to actually mm-hmm. just be and cry. And I got sick because obviously I ate cheesecake off the street and, um, <laughs> you know, a, a bunch of other stuff. But um and then we came back and we decided, you know, when we came back, let's take a month and just not really talk or see each other and see how that goes. And mm-hmm. it went, you know, well. And then so after that time, we were like, okay, let's get together and talk about things. And as one does when you love each other, we, at first it was awkward for like 10 minutes and then it was like, I want to touch you. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah, of and here we are. Uh, but, but so eventually, you know, we can be reconnected and he was going to spend, and he had started going to meetings and you had gotten a sponsor and what, or you <laughs> didn't. 
Okay, maybe he did it. That, 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 that's the face of I should have told you the truth then too. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, right. well, no, I mean, of course. I, I attempted it, but like yeah. a lot of that was like, you, I said those things because I wanted you to think. Because I was a CEO. Please, yeah. please love me again. Please tell yeah. me I'm worth it again. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. not, you, you don't know what I'm doing. I, I, yeah. I want to do these things. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And, and so he stayed over one night and I was in oh, my bed bad. and I had this gut feeling. Oh, bless. And he was in the bathroom, which is like kind of like a U-turn for bed. So I couldn't see it. And I was, and I was like, what are you doing in there? He's like, nothing. Like, come in here. The door is open. He's like, come in here. Nothing. And so I was like, I'm not going to come in there. And then my gut went off. And I was like, I'm going to fucking go in there. And so I went <clears> and, um, are you okay with me? Doug? Yeah, yeah. Dude, it's, it's fine. Um, and there was like a needle in his pocket. Yeah. And I was like, what is that? And he had forgotten. He put it there. And he told me it was steroids at the yeah. time. So then we had a conversation about steroids. Why are you doing steroids? I love you exactly as you are. Like right. we had this whole yeah, you're like a body thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I need to get down thing. like this. I'm right. Like, See, I'm like, like, let me help you. But, but that's like, so smart, addicts. Yeah, I'm like, okay, well, what argument's going to be the least right now? Oh, it's a steroid argument Yo. for sure. Because then there's this and that, Perfect. and so like that's what we do. I, what what <clears throat> what's damage control? My whole life is damage control. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to cause the least yeah. amount of uh, of shame, guilt, and frustration? And like, uh, you know, I might be able to get out of it right here. Yeah. And at that point, at that point, I was like. I, I wasn't, I almost wasn't even mad because it wasn't surprising anymore. And yeah. I sort of, we had sort of broken up. Like we were sort of navigating this new space. And I was like, okay, this is not, what am I going to, whatever, you know? Yeah. And so it was kind of along the lines of, you need to figure yourself out. And so he apparently talked to his sponsor that night, got rid of things. I don't know how soon after that, but you eventually, Ooh, you no. can kind of, why don't you share? Yeah, sort of well, what I mean, after. that that was kind of like the beginning demise of it. You know, if you're an addict like I am, like I, I can't keep it, going for very long. Things get really bad for me really fast um, because it's progressive illness, right? I don't, I don't start where I left off. I mean, I don't start at the beginning. I start where I left off. And um, shortly after that, uh, I remember I leaving there and I don't know how long ago I was mainly staying in my car at this moment, but she didn't know that. Like, she could, I have to have everything together. Uh, so my friend called me and he said, hey, he's an, he's an alcoholic. He's an ex-veteran and he's really close to me. He helped me through a hard time uh, a couple years ago when we were going through treatment. And he goes, hey, you know, I don't want to be alone. Uh, can you come hang out with me? And yes, please. I need a break. I need a place where I can actually be honest. I don't Aww. have to hide things. I can just be me, yeah. uh, which is never in life. And, uh, you know, we're he is in this hotel room in Huntington and we go and we hang out. And like, I just remember the first time, like this feeling of being relaxed. I finally could sit down and I didn't have to pretend anymore. I could put me out and, and this is what it is. And I can don't have to be a secret. And I could just be me. And it was great. Um, and then I went to the rest, use the restroom. And as I came back out, uh, he had done some of my drugs on the table. And I remember looking at his eyes and then I watched him fall out, stop breathing, stop breathing in front of my face. He's too, and I remember going over to him, trying to keep him alive. I'm screaming for help. We were in a locked hotel room and I'm trying to scream for help by doing chest compressions on him. And, and I don't know what I'm doing really. I'm screaming and I'm like, Oh fuck, this is real now. Like, this is real. Fuck. I, I can't even get five minutes of, of any kind of peace. And, um, while I'm, while this is all going on, I remember I thought three things. I thought one, why does he get this break? Right. Mm -hmm. I was using, I wanted a break from life. Like I, this never happens to me. So, uh, how come you, how come he gets it? He doesn't deserve it. I do. Mm -hmm. Right. Two. I also, I love this person. I know who he is intimately. Like I know his family and his kids and um, I realized that if he dies, I'm never going to be the same. I already take enough toxic ownership over my life as it is. And if you add his death into it, it's a wrap. I might as well just fuck it and just keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, don't look back. Uh, and then one of the best things that ever happened to me, I, I also said, um, cause I, I'm, I'm typically, uh, I use alone. I don't use with people. I'm not around people. I'm always by myself. And, uh, I said, uh, I, I, I always used to say, well, if this happens to me, well, and I remember specifically saying, you know, when this happens to me, my if became a when. And I knew I was going to die if I continue. And when this happens to me, I'm going to be alone. No one's going to be here to save me. That scared me because I don't want to die. And that that was the moment where I'm like, well, sh it's not a game anymore, guys. Like, it's the, the, mm -hmm. the party's done. Like, it, luckily, he survived, went to the hospital. But uh, that was the last night I used. I went and called uh, a good friend of mine that works for Treehouse and said, hey, I need help, man. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And that started this journey. And that was really only almost 90 days ago tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's wow. heavy, a heavy situation, but wow. that, that's the kind of addict I am. You know, I, I, yeah. I need massive events to happen before I can stop. Once I start, that's the simplest thing. 
I'm just so proud to work with the brands that we work with. Chosen Foods is not an exception. Uh, They have new goddess dressings. That's right, goddess. The branding is just so on point. It's this beautiful goddess on these five different dressings. They are so delicious, irresistible, and I honestly just cannot even describe how good these dressings are. The Golden Goddess dressing is my favorite. It gets its name and color from a warm blend of turmeric and ginger. Turmeric, great for fighting inflammation. And these dressings are just so thoughtfully made with pure avocado oil, 100% pure avocado oil, um, which has heart healthy fats, great for you. And you can be sure that these dressings are all natural, non-GMO, gluten-free, plant-based, and free from soy and canola oils. And I can't talk about chosen foods without talking about their avocado oil and coconut oil sprays. And now they have flavorful herbs and spices in their sprays. Huh? Infused sprays, you say? There are nine insanely tasty flavor combinations like warm gingerbread, spiced chai, citrus pepper, lemon dill, chili lime, chipotle, garlic, and more. And I can't wait for you to try them. So try them. Let us know uh, your favorites. We always love to know. Uh, Go to chosenfoods.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 during checkout to get 50% off your order of $10 or more. I am telling you people, you need to go on to chosenfoods.com slash almost 30. Use the code almost 30. I would stock up for the season, for the summer. Um, just to anticipate you're, you're going to be hosting all the best parties. That's chosenfoods.com slash almost 30. Use the promo code almost 30 for 50% off your order of $10 or more. They don't tell you that when you start a small business, holy hell, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, especially when it comes to invoicing, administrative tasks, You know, if you pull back the curtain, you'd see a lot of entrepreneurs uh, crying in a pillow because it gets overwhelming. But we have totally been saved by HoneyBook. We are saving time and stress. If you are a creative entrepreneur, freelancer, small business owner, HoneyBook can help you stay organized with custom templates and automation tools. You can even use HoneyBook to consolidate services you already use like QuickBooks, Google Suite, and MailChimp. And over 75,000 photographers, designers, event professionals, and other entrepreneurs have seen Saved hundreds to thousands of hours a year. We are included. And our partners, people that we work with are so impressed, are so impressed um, by the automated tools that we use through HoneyBook to streamline our professional relationship. So if you'd like to try HoneyBook for our listeners only right now, HoneyBook is offering 50% off your first year with promo code almost. Payment is flexible and this promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. So you can go to honeybook.com and use the promo code ALMOST30 for 50% off your first year. Honestly, honeybook.com, H-O-N-E-Y-B-O-O-K.com. Use the promo code ALMOST30 for 50% off your first year. What does it feel like when your family, your friends want to help you and are giving you as much love as they know how? Mm -hmm. What does that that feel like in your body and your heart? Because I I have a few friends who have family members who are addicts and are still using and out there and they don't even know where they are. So it's like you have this family who cares so much. You know what I mean? Like, So I'm wondering, do you just forget or... Just getting into the head. Well, I, I mean, honestly, it doesn't. I think it's different for each person. Like for me, example, like my mother is really the only family. I mean, I have extended family, but my mom's really the only one that's been there for me, mm-hmm. right? And um, my pain that I experienced from my past and how I grew up, and and all that overwhelms that. Like I, I don't want to feel it anymore. Mm. I the shame and the guilt and and, and all the traumas. I, I, I don't want to feel it anymore. So. In my brain, I would sacrifice everything not to feel, not to remember, not to feel. I don't really care how much you love me. Like that doesn't stop the pain, right? So my whole goal is I, n- I want to not hurt. That's it. Right. And so that op- that overwhelms any kind of love that anyone can give you, you know? Uh, and that's 
first and foremost, because if I don't get that, I feel like I'm going to die. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's, that for most people, it drowns all that out, that pain and that shame and the guilt. Yeah. It overwhelms everything. And I just am so thankful. Like, I just love you both so much. Mm-hmm. And I'm so thankful you're sharing and Absolutely. being so honest. And, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about like using alone, it's like shame loves to get you alone. Shame loves when you're alone. Yeah. And being in situations like this where you're surrounded by people and you're being very honest, even just saying that one lie that, you know, came up is so important Mm -hmm. and not small. And not that it matters what I say, but when you do think about shame in situations where any of us have felt shame, it loves when you're alone. And that's the moving away from like where we are as humanity and consciousness expansion, which we've talked about yesterday. And um, fear is aloneness. It, it, and that's... It needs you to be alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It yeah. also can't survive. Yeah, exactly. So your friend... So when he got... Um, when the, the hospital came and everything like that, or the the he was able to go to the hospital, what happens in that situation? Like, do you get... Does someone get in tr- like trouble? Or well, like what? Uh, the basic... I mean, he uh, was resuscitated, obviously. And um, not obviously... Uh, well, in California, you have what's called the Good Samaritan Law because mm. people were dying because um, no one would call on overdoses. Wow. So um, if you call on an overdose, whoever's at the scene, you don't get questioned. You don't get you just you get your name and wow. then they let you go no matter what's found. You know, but as soon as you leave the property where you're at, then that's a different story. But, um, you know, that that's because people were not saving anybody. You're OD and I, I'm going to get in trouble. So it's me or you. You got to go. Yeah. yeah, And that's not OK. And, and that's one of the things I thought of uh, in the moment is. I I don't care if I'm in trouble. Like I just want him to live, you know, because it just I care about him. So Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people overdose in my lifetime, absolutely, uh, but nobody I've cared about. So that was an experience too. Like I I'll help you if you OD. Like that's one thing, but like I care about this person. Like I don't want him to die, which is I've never had that feeling before. Mm. You know, so yeah. And it's been an ongoing process. Like I mean, the other day I called him crying. I was I just. Google fentanyl and <laughs> oh, don't Google fentanyl. And, you know, through this process, I've been very open about, you know, with the people close to me about sort of being the partner to someone. And and, and a lot of people who don't understand addiction are going to tell, they want you to stay safe. I get it. Like I get when for my loved ones to say, what are you doing in that? And so these last few months have been this conversation internal conversation with me and my coach and my friends and like whoever. And you really have to just like a, a little word of wisdom. You really need to be careful with who you seek advice from. Um, mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, obviously the people that love you, but just keep in like, if nothing else, make sure you have a strong enough foundation in your own desires to come back to yourself, no matter what information comes into you and make a judgment call based on what you really, what feels right to you. Because if I had followed the shoulds, in my life, of all the things I thought I should do, I would never have this incredible man. He has grown me in ways that I can't even articulate. And and he, the things that he brings to the table are so different. You know, so much of my life, I'm like, I need this like a successful entrepreneur who's jetting around the country and doing all the things. And it's like, no, no I'm going to give you exactly what you need. And it was this love. I mean, Billy is someone who makes me feel. Um, or gives me the opportunity to be exactly who I am, you know? Yeah. And so through this conversation, it's been, it's been for me internally, do I close this door and move on? And then maybe we reconnect one day down the road and things work, but I also can't hold on to that. So it was that. And then the other side was, or do I stay in this and put in the work and, and see what happens? Mm. And in the beginning, it was, I was like, I'm out. I was so hurt. And then eventually I got really clear and I, and I took the, a lot of the space that I needed. I haven't taken on any work stuff. Like I literally have said no to everything this year because I needed that space. And I finally realized that regardless of if this works out between us or not, this process will grow me, you know, and I'll, I'll be able to help other people. And more than anything, he's worth fighting for. He is the most incredible. That's very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he really is one of the most incredible, beautiful souls. He's such a light. He's so and and he's so sensitive, and which is probably what what has driven you to use a lot of the time is you have such a beautiful, sensitive um, heart. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And and he's worth it. And I know that 
we together were given this experience because we're going to speak out about it and we're going to be able to help a lot of people. And so the truth is we're going through it right now. Like this is the first time. And that's why I, I, you know, when we, when we were talking about this podcast, I was like, you two are the, the ones who I would have this conversation with. And let me talk to Billy and see if it's something that he wants to do. You know, it's his story to tell too. And so I'm just so grateful that we're in this space and I hope we can return down the road and say, okay, this is what we learned because we're in it right now. Mm -hmm. But it has brought, it has been some of the most growth provoking conscious conversations about our dynamic and how we work together and how we support each other and how we, and, and what it comes back to, and I know you'll agree on this is what it comes back to is focus on yourself. Yes. If I'm going to heal him or I'm going to help him, it's only by me continuing to do the work on myself. Yeah. yeah. In setting boundaries. And like, one of the things is if we're going to be together, like you have to work an Al-Anon program. Like yeah. you have to speak the same language, mm-hmm. you know, cause I'm just learning to speak this language itself. You know, it's the first time I've been, a, I've been around recovery for a long time. And, and I can honestly say it's the first time I feel like I'm in it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I, I'm invested. I'm fully invested. Um, and you know, that's realizing that I don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. And I'm not your solution, mm-hmm. yeah. but but I want to find an answer with you for sure. And it's brought up for me. I've spoken pretty open about my um, experiences with food addiction and disordered eating. And I spent time in Overeaters Anonymous. And just recently, it made me realize from the, the co- my codependency was in, he became this emotional support to me. He was what, instead, I used to use food to take the edge off and for love and comfort and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he kind of stepped in and took the food's role. So I was like, cool, the food is like mellow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and now I realize it's like this light bulb just recently in the last wow. couple of weeks of, oh, Billy's a new food. And I mean, you, you guys are looking at me. He's a snack, all right? <laughs> but, uh, but you listen. know, and so, so it's really cool because his, this experience, Bill, Billy is someone who has no ego and he is, will, he is one of the most humble guys and one of the most, he just wants to serve and he just wants to help. And he is willing to do the work on himself. He is the like in a conversation to hear a man. Always he will he will see his role in it. He won't accuse me. He just says maybe I didn't see it this way, or maybe I missed something here. Or, you know, it's just to for for to see a man. And I think that's why this conversation of mindful masculinity is so important as well. But to see a man feel like speak about their feelings and be vulnerable is so important. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, through through this experience, it's led me back into the Overeaters Anonymous program, which has been incredible and into Al-Anon. And like we said, this shame thrives in being solo. And so what a beautiful thing to um, find these, com- these are uh, recovery. It's, it's based on community. And, and it doesn't mean that it's the solution for everyone, you know, but for us, it's been really helpful. Oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, we're equally as grateful to hold space for a conversation like this and that you trust us. Like I that, do. You know, we don't take that lightly. So thank, thank you. you. But I find it so interesting within like, just in like the micro of our community. And when they, sometimes they'll ask us, like they'll post in the secret Facebook group, like, I really want to see expanders for like this type of relationship. Like show me this. And it's so funny how we, and I've done this too, where I'm like, I really want to see like the ideal, like show me that. <laughs> when really what is more productive and deeply uh, kind of encoding like in our body and be able to receive is, is seeing the real. So like Mm. listening to a conversation like this and understanding the highs and the lows and the dynamics of, of growth and expansion and then, you know, relapse and recovery and, and dependency and then being independent within relationship. Like I need to see that. Mm. You know what I mean? Because we all are, we all have those aspects within our relationships or will have those aspects within our relationships. So where was I going with that? But I just, I kind of want to highlight that, that like, this is real and this is what we should be seeking in like the ideal model of that. Yeah. I mean, Um, we're mirrors for each other. Yeah, I look at Billy and what we've learned in the last, I mean, for me, ego, right? Mm. Service, like, the way he lives his life, it's the opposite of, uh, you know, and not that I, we just, we, we, he teaches me so much. Yeah. And I think the most beautiful, what happened with the codependency piece and what he was saying is he learned to serve me because I represented security. Mm-hmm. So what happened was he ended up fearing saying anything or doing anything that could potentially push me away. Uh, so as a result, I wasn't challenged. 
you know, if no one, if your partner should be there to give you feedback with love, with love being the core, but feedback is so important in a relationship because I love growth. And, and because he didn't, it was too vulnerable for him to say, Hey, you're being fucking selfish when you do that. Or like, you need to look, like, look at this thing. He couldn't, he didn't want to say that because it would, Mm. and so our dynamic got really yeah. I off. mean, a lot of it stems from that, you know, not being able to live my truth. Right. First of all, I didn't know my truth. I mean, I, I kind of different versions of it for everybody, but, um, but like if I told her the truth on things then she would leave or she, I wouldn't be worth it. And if Which she goes, true. my security's mm-hmm. gone and like, Oh, don't leave me. I just, I remember saying we were getting in an argument on the bus and I remember just telling her, go the look bus? at, Oh, like our tour bus. Yeah, our tour bus. Oh, yeah. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> we're relatable. We think it's that like. <laughs> we <get> the, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but we, I, we got in an argument and I was like, can you, can you just, but she, I felt like she was making me feel like I wasn't doing enough. I didn't have an online business. I wasn't starting my, I, mm-hmm. all I was doing was the tour. And for me, that was a lot. And I remember saying, you know what? Like I have a dog. I have a, I have a girlfriend I love. I have, for the first time, I have some money in the bank. I, I don't have to struggle. Can I just enjoy this without mm-hmm. having to push me anywhere? Because yeah. it's going to go. Yeah. Let me enjoy it before it leaves. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was like my initial, like I, and, and everything I did was just to, yeah. I expected it to go because if you're going to see the real me eventually. So I just want to try to piece everything together. So you were just, just happy to keep everything all right. And I was projecting my not enoughness onto him, you know, mm-hmm. like my self-worth for a very long time was attached to achievement. I'm going to have all these businesses and I'm going to go on tour and I'm going to be this on Instagram and whatever it is. And so much of my self-worth was that, mm-hmm. right? And so I was valuing him in that way. And those weren't the things that he was valuing. He was evaluating like his serenity and peace. Yeah. And and uh and the thing is with um what Billy was saying is like we get so afraid for someone to see who we really are that we mm. like, put on these masks and we wear these different, you know, personalities. When in the the reality is all we want to do is see that that real self. You know, I see it. It's like those glimpses. It's when you can love it's why you love someone over and over no matter what happens? And you're like, it's because I see you. Like you're in there. You, I used to hate when you said it to me. You're like I know. I I, I, I mm-hmm. see past all that. I see what you could be. Your potential. I see. You know, she she's. I see. We like, don't use pot- that word potential anymore. No, not least, at all. So. But yeah, <laughs> but, you know, she used to say like, I I I, I see you, and I'd be like, no, you don't. Like, yeah, I, I I don't like me enough to look at me. You know, and she could see past all that stuff, which I'm so grateful that she did because mm-hmm. that was like a little bit of hope that maybe I was missing something mm-hmm. that my subjective reality yeah. wasn't actually fact. Yeah. And that was a huge, huge realization. And every That's woman not- on our tour, you know, Billy, there was a part of our tour where Billy came out and spoke. And mm-hmm. the women, like, <laughs> I would read there, they'd post something on Instagram after, and they'd be like, and the best part was like, Billy came out and he told his story. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But really, his story and that moment when they got to hear him speak and they saw his light, like everyone else can see it. I said, That's why, that's why you hurt so many people, is because you're very lovable and they see your light. And so it hurt, like, you should be, you should understand that, that you have worth solely even based on the fact, obviously just because you're here, but solely on the fact that you can even hurt people. If you didn't matter, then you wouldn't hurt people. No, I, like, I mean, then, then, like your behaviors, actions wouldn't hurt people. I mean, I get that now, but you yeah. realize I'm, I'm fighting. Uh, we fight for me, 35 years of conditioning. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, uh, Paula, my therapist, says, like, mm-hmm. I, I decide what the world is between kneecaps and belly buttons. And between that time for me was very traumatic. And and, and I believed life to be a certain way. Mm-hmm. So I operated on that that uh, motive. Like, this is, I have to protect me from the world. I'm really not worth it. Uh, I'm not worth loving. I'm not, there's, I, all these things were built in. Uh, and then now, you know, I, I live my life to to not suffer from things I did, you know. So yeah. it's hard. You realize For the it's... mindful masculinity, like what does that mean to you guys? She's she's more of a masculine one in the relationship. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Uh, um, <laughs> mindful masculinity to me means just, I think more than anything men, and it doesn't just have to be men, but I guess speaking to, to men directly would be to be in touch with their emotions, like tap into this this fem- the, like what how the feminine tends to tap into intuition. We tra- tend to lead a life from feeling. I spent most of my life not feeling my feelings and shoveling down, them down with food. I was never vulnerable. I never, it just wasn't the conversation that I was having. And when I learned to feel my feelings and stay in my body, I realized I had this compass. It, ta- it told me everything I needed to know. Rather than, you know, reasoning something out in your head, all the shoulds, 
I actually could trust how I felt in my body and follow that. And so I think for men to be able to actually be feelings based um, in some ways and to follow their emotions and, and to talk about them and be vulnerable. I can't imagine the pressure that men have on them to be a certain way and to be strong and to be manly and to not be sensitive and cry like God. Mm-hmm. I don't have any of that. <laughs> I was never raised that way. Yeah. I didn't have like a strong masculine figure in my life. You know, I was raised by my mother, right. And my grandmother, right. So that's, I have a, I, very feminine. I, I feel a lot of feminine energy. Like I know the golden girls by name. Mm-hmm. Like I, I enjoy cooking and cleaning and loving and caring and nurturing. Like these are all things that I enjoy. I don't really care about sports. I don't, I don't care how tough I am. I don't need to prove how much bravado I like. I don't care. You can do all that, you know, but which is, you know, I think for me, like the mindful masculinity, I just kind of combined what the women around me showed me plus with my own like innate masculinity energy. So it's just like, a, it's a nice combination of both. You know, I don't have to be tough, but I don't have to know everything. But I, you know, I judge the world on by on on uh, your actions. You know, like, do you love enough? You know, you can't take any of this stuff with you. Mm-hmm. I, I, how are you treat the fellow man next to you? You know, like or woman next to you, people in general. I don't know, but mm-hmm. it's just not having to be what society thinks a man should be. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's. I lived most of my life trying to fit into this box that people told me I had to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I realized I didn't have to anymore. What do you do on days when you're like, like, what do you tell yourself when you're like, this is hard? And like the days where he's relapsed and like, it's been (laughs) like, what has that been like your inner conversation for? Yeah. So, so I've been doing Reiki and um, hypnotherapy recently. And I always have meditated for years and I work with a coach really closely, which are, I'm going to first acknowledge that those are major luxuries and privileges um, and not necessary either. Um, there's a lot of free, easy ways to do that sort of stuff and free recordings for hypnotherapy, that sort of thing. But what I was doing when they first found out, I was really angry. Um, and there was a woman who reached out to me on Instagram and during Billy and I's sort of mm. time of gray, the, the gray area, she reached out and said that she had been with him. And... Um, it was, it slapped me across the face. My ego did not like that. Of course. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't outside. I mean, it was, it, I was on a dating app. Like I wasn't, you know, we were, it was a gray area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, um, it was a gray area. So we were like kind of together, but, but, you know, you know, the power of women oh looking after God. each other. I was like, yeah. yes, girl, yes, yeah, girl. I appreciate she's lovely, that. you know, and, and reached out and said, you know, I've been through something like this and I don't want, you know, just was really beautiful. And, um, and that was like a real, because, because that I took personally. The addiction, I never took personally. I didn't think it was my fault. And so it was kind of easy to say, I just want to come at this from love, but I have to like set boundaries. Like how do we navigate this? But the other woman, <laughs> that hit me. And so there were five and I was angry. And I talked to you like I've never talked to you before. We're usually very conscious communicators, Ooh, I will say. Yeah, I think it was we're... not fun. <laughs> yeah, I was mad. And um, I didn't talk to him for five days, which was five miserable days when you are used to talking to your best friend and sharing life with someone. And I wrote letters during that time to him because I like had to get the emotions yeah. out. Like, this is how I feel. And eventually what happened in is as we navigated this experience and as part of this recovery is we, it cracked our hearts open and through Reiki and through hypnotherapy, like one of the things that kept coming to me was open your heart, open your heart. And I'm like, God, I feel like I'm open. I feel like my heart's open. And, and something clicked. I was on a walk with my, our dog and, um, and my heart just like saw it from what it really was. And I saw him as the light filled being he is. And I understood why he might make those choices. And he did a really good job of articulating why, you yeah. know, and, and it was just really beautiful to under, to like step back and say, and be able to feel like I could see everything from love. And what it did was it led to this conversation between us about ego, about codependency, about like we started lo- like learning about. It was the first honest conversation was, we've 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 had since I first met you. It was mm. just no holds bar. This is what like this is what it is. Uh, yeah. Regardless of how yeah, you feel really about raw. what I'm about to say, yeah. this is how it is. Yeah. yeah. This is the truth. Yeah. Of start to finish, this is it. Yeah. And she yeah. put her truth out there, and we saw where the truth matched, and we're like, okay, that's real because both are both. And then where it didn't, we talked more, and yeah. it's huge, hugely powerful. Yeah. And, and I don't know. But for someone going through it, through being with recovery, 
there are endless amounts of resources. So for me, journaling helps me really get stuff out of my mind. Um, there's a lot of literature, there's podcasts, but um, the meetings, if, if that appeals to you, um, go go a few times. Don't make a decision off the first time. Um, but community is really powerful because we tend to think we're alone in everything and no one, and I, I still struggle with that. That person can't relate relate to my lifestyle, and that person, you know, and 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 you realize more and more as you go, and you're in these communities that you hear the things you need to hear. So there's so many free resources. That's a beautiful thing. There's so many things out there to support. I'm curious how you guys have been able to create those boundaries or be more independent within the relationship to support recovery, just to support like you both in a relationship as a couple. So what does that look like? And has it been challenging? I, I think we're still figuring that out right now. We, we this is the first time we've ever approached it like this. Um, for me, like I, I know that we both have to work our own programs. Like one of the things issues with us is that she's still filled with resentment and distrust and anger right. uh, and, and embarrassment. All these things. Like I can't hang out with her family all the time and and her friends. Like there's a, there's all these issues, right? And then I felt like she would look to me to like, well, what are we, what are you going to do about this? When are we going to talk about this? Well, I can't solve that for you. Yeah. You have to go figure out how to solve that on your own. And that path is different than my path. I'm figuring out my stuff with that. And so I can come to an even playing fit with you. And then, you know, over time we work on the trust, right? That's consistency over a long period of time. Can we be transparent with each other? Can we tell each other honestly? That led to a really couple of good bunch of conversations about like, you know, do we want to see other people? Do we not? Do we want to live openly? Do we not? Like, I, yeah, I, you know, we were looking like, to open relationships. Like, what does that and look like, like? Understanding that, you well, know, and, mm-hmm. and truthfully, it's just the the thing that was the most attractive part about that is just the honesty that comes with it. Yeah, and that's what we were talking that about was here. Hot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I got yeah. hot quickly. It, it, it did <laughs> though. Um, but yeah, can can we be honest? Yeah, can, can we just practice on being honest and transparent? Let's just start there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And. Whatever that brings, we'll go to the next step. But let's just see if we can be honest with each other about everything we do all the time. Even if it's like, I really don't want to see you tonight. I want to go and I'm going over here and yeah. I need a break from all this. Can I just say that? Because usually I'm, no, no, no I'll, I'll, I'll break my boundaries because I want her to be happy. Right. And so where that lies, it, it, you know, and that, that's that been really difficult to navigate. For me, it's reminding myself that we don't have a relationship if there's if he doesn't have his recovery. Or both of us mm-hmm. don't really. You know, so so... I have to come second. And what I had, you know, working through with my coach when we were going through this, I realized that what I had to do was be strong enough to break the codependency I had on the emotional comforts he provided for me. But I had to be strong enough to give him permission to not take care of me or my feelings right now. And are we doing the best job at it? Probably not. But to give to. you to give him permission to say your your recovery comes first. So if there's not time for me at the end of the day, then there's not time. We'll figure it out. But, you know? but I'll put my recovery first and you put yours first. Yeah. Right. So no one's coming in second, really. Yeah. And, and you're first, I'm first. And when, when that's said and done, then whatever time we have left, we'll connect and share about that experience mm-hmm. and walk the same path, going mm-hmm. the same direction, rather, as opposed to me trying to carry her or her trying to carry me. Yeah. And what, 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 he, you know, these drugs are no joke. This is not like, I mean, you know, not to lessen what I struggle with with food, but it's just not as life risking immediately. You know, it is long term, of course. But but if we don't prioritize, if we don't prioritize that, there's no us. He will die. He's not you, like he always says this. He's like, I've had enough. I've had a lot of chances. And what's that thing they say? Like you either end up in institutions. Oh, jails, institutions jails, are death. To do in, institutions are death. I got two out of three right now. So right? trying to so, stay out of the third one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's interesting too. the time um, I had like a situation where I had like uh, infidelity and it was a great during a gray area. Mm-hmm. Guys love gray areas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was one thing I learned is never fucking be in a gray area. <laughs> Um, but also too, it allowed us to really break down enough to rebuild where there was vulnerability, there was authenticity, there was like an openness, there was like an emotional connection enough for me to like, for us to rebuild. And it really was the beginning of our relationship together, which was a really crazy thing. And that's why I think completely differently about those situations now to this day. You know, I have no judgment against 
either party and I just see them from such a different light and perspective. Mm. Um, how has the Reiki and hypnotherapy helped you? Like, what has that been like? Great question. Um, the Reiki is kind of just, I'm not doing it formally. I used to work with Kelsey Patel, who's amazing. Mm. She did it for me like five years ago and she's just phenomenal. She's here in LA, um, but has a lot of resources. Um, but uh, I actually, during the depths of some of our challenging times, um, I was on a photo shoot because I model as well. And I was on a photo shoot in Boston and my makeup artist and my stylist were both Reiki teachers. Wow. And I was like in this really dark like place and they both did Reiki on me. And I really, they, they sort of, they did it separately, came to me with the same message about opening my heart. Like they felt that individually. And then the hypnotherapy I do guided with a friend of mine who is, do it, does it just virtually. And same thing. A lot of like heart opening stuff. So it's been really powerful. I'm just really open to whatever is out there. Um, I, I think what's been hard is I'm, I'm really into self-care. It's something that I, that I, you know, have made sort of part of my living and, and I do the things for the most part, not perfect, but I pretty much meditate every day and I was journaling every day and I was writing, I was doing all of the things and working out most of the time and eating healthy, you know, while we were going through a lot of this and, and it was, and I was like, I'm doing all of the things and it's not working. And my coach actually said, she said, you're so used to being able to figure things out and put things in boxes that this gray area is going to be the absolute best place for you to be. Because if you can get comfortable in this gray area where something doesn't fit in the box and you can't define it and you don't know what's going on, but you still have to exist throughout it, that's going to be really Mm. freeing. So uh, I've been trying. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. How have you talked to your family? Oh, I mean, it, it truthfully, we have friends. Yeah. But. I mean, it, I get defensive of Billy a lot and mm-hmm. it's hard not to because yeah. the thing with relationships and whenever my friends ask me for relationship advice, I say, I, I, I tend to not give it. I, I don't want to give it because I'm not in your relationship. And as a friend, you're oftentimes mm-hmm. seeing the bad stuff because when it's good, they're with the partner and they're enjoying it together. Mm-hmm. And then when it's bad, they can't go to that person that's closest to them because it has to do with that person. And so they go to you. And so you're going to hear the like negative and the argument and all that for a lot, most of your friends' relationships. Or Kayla's loved oldest time. Right. Loves mm-hmm. loved ones' yeah. relationships. So what it comes down to is seeking advice from people you trust who are living the kind of lifestyle or thinking in the same way you are. Um, but you know, my coach, the best, she doesn't give me advice. That's the truth. She just asks me questions questions and quite, you know, she's incredible. And so she really, her job is to help me get clear on what I really want. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's been, and then with family, we haven't navigated yet. The truth is, um, addiction comes with a lot of stigma and it comes with Absolutely. a lot of misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. And if, if you didn't know someone who, if, if you saw Billy and you would never think this guy is shooting drugs on his arm secretly, right? Mm. And 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 then and so your idea is what you see driving downtown LA or whatever, and you see addicts and whatever. But th- these addiction problems are help- happening in some of the wealthiest communities and in in high schools, like this. These like wealthy, you know, like affluent, educated privileged communities are dealing with this in some of the biggest ways. And so I think that Billy's story and these opportunities to share is, is an opportunity to change the stigmas around addiction. And so for me with, with, um, with family and with friends, I just, I have to, I get, it's, it's been tough and I go back and forth, but I have some, I have incredible friends and for the most part, they just love me and they listen and they don't tell me what to do. They just say, we just want you to be happy and, um, so that's that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well said. Yeah. That's always so hard. I have a guy friend who, this is like on a small, very small scale, but has a girl and they've been through some stuff. He would express it to friends and now the friends have that idea of the girl right. and they don't see the laughing and giggling in bed at night or, yeah. you know, making pancakes in the morning. And I remember that even through high school and college, that was like the way girls operated. Yeah. yeah. You would, you know, come together on these negative parts of your relationship, mm-hmm. express them. And then two weeks later, you'd be like, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> and then you don't want to tell them because you're, exactly. you're like, oh, and then it pushes, and then that's not fair because it pushes your friendship away. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Because it puts them in a position where now you're kind of resenting them when all they're doing is being loving and trying to help you, you know, know, like, so you have to be really cautious. Um, but I'm grateful and lucky that, you know, most of my friends are very 
conscious and yeah. loving and understanding, but it's just something that we've had to navigate. And again, like I said before, we're in the beginning of it. I am, I am fresh to this Al Anon world. I am fresh. It's just, it's fresh, you know, it's new. And so I think it's important to, to share when you're in that point too and say, like, I don't really know. What I'm learning in Al Anon is like not to um, check up on him all the time. Like all the times where I'm like, what are you doing? What are you, you know, what's going on in there? Uh, (laughs) Not to check up. I'm learning um, not to, like they say, like don't dump the alcohol down the drain. It just causes more like shame and issue. Like, you know, uh, there's just, I'm learning a lot with how to deal with it and how to focus on me, you know, and and I'm not perfect, but I'm learning a lot. And, And I'm so grateful. I feel really grateful to have to, for my life to have gone in this addiction arena, because I feel like the tools that are learned and taught through that program, the self-awareness through any sort of recovery programs are so powerful. Universal. They're universal. Mm -hmm. They're powerful. They transcend the addiction themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading this book, Codependent No More right now by Melody Beattie, um, really famous book on like codependency. And, um, and I'm reading this list of the things that identify as codependent. I'm like, okay, so literally everyone, I don't know anyone who could read through this list and not highlight 10 of these things. And so I think it's actually our culture that builds relationships based on you complete me, you're my other half versus two individual whole beings that then come together to experience a sort of third identity um, that that is even brighter together, right? But they're individual, they're whole on their own. Mm. Uh I think I like addiction the most of everything because it's a very easy way to see your malady and what you need to work on. Because a lot of people go their whole life struggling with this. So they don't know how to put a name to it with food, sex, porn, mm-hmm. whatever it is. You, be, you could be codependent your whole life and your life would be not as flourishing if you you know didn't get a chance to work on this stuff. Like I do. I'm in it every day. And because of my addiction, it's so glaring in my face. I can see it very clear. right? And, and mm-hmm. I get a chance to work on it. A lot of people go through their whole life never getting to work on any of this or looking at these parts of themselves, or sharing this, or the vulnerability and the truth, and being set free. And a lot of people I know in my family, they're very, they're, they're so, they don't know another way to live. And it's, I know what that's like. That's miserable. You know, you're not as free and as connected as you could be. And that's what, you know, that, that's, I'm like really grateful for being in this arena as well. Mm-hmm. You, know? you said that some of the, the parts of recovery are applicable to everyone in life. Can you talk about a few things? Oh God, all the 12 steps of, of any anonymous program, because it stands from alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, those 12 steps are applied to everybody, right? Um, uh, okay, so like your, your, your life can become unmanageable, right? Uh, with anything, we could do it with, like I said, sex, drugs, rock and roll, women, doesn't matter how it affects your life. Um, I, I, yeah, I love how Russell Brand, like his interpretation of the steps, like I'm fucked, I'm not going to unfuck myself, but I'm willing to be unfucked. Mm-hmm. Right, those are the first three steps. Like that's the best part about mm-hmm. it, and like um, the ability that I'm not God and I don't have to be, but I, I, there's something out there bigger than me, right? And, and there's bigger purpose. I think a lot of people. The fourth step is great because that does it like an inventory of your resentments. Everybody feels that I'm wrong because of this, you know, and it's your fault. But if you break that down, you can go through all the steps in every situation. You realize, oh, I had a part in it. Ooh, I played everything. a part in it. I played a part mm-hmm. in most everything. Very few exceptions in life did you not play a part in something. Mm-hmm. And even then, that. your part in it is to maybe be vocal about it or you know share your story so you can help somebody else. And that's your part in it. And if you don't want to do that, then that's another story. But wow. but yeah, so, so that applies to everybody, right? Um, being able to uh, make a list of people you've harmed and be, become willing to make amends to them all, except when to do so would injure them or others, right? So certain ones you can't make because my might hurt somebody else in, in, in the course of it, but make amends for you. And not just say, I'm sorry, but make amends. Go to somebody and say, hey, how can I make this right? I'm sorry I wronged you and this is what I did and this is how I hurt you. How can I make it right? And then do whatever is asked of you to do that. That's powerful, right? Then you can actually walk through life with your head high. You, everybody looks down and they, they do things to people and they don't want to talk about it. So they avoid people and this and that. And that adds up after a while. You know, and so to live clean and clear and take a 10 step every day. So at the end of my day, I, I, where have I gone wrong? Where have, who have I harmed? What have I said? Do I need to make an amends for something? Do you need to approach somebody and clear your day so you can go to, you can go to sleep with like your, your head empty and just full of love? And then pray and meditate for how can I carry this message of recovery and love to anybody? Yeah, everyone does that. And you should, you know? 
Mm. It applies to everybody. And then like the little principles within the program, you know, easy does it, it you know, slow down, you know, be, have patience with yourself, you know? So I think those are, those apply to everybody. Yeah. And if everyone could do the 12 steps, I guarantee their life would be a lot easier. Yeah. I've heard that. It's true. You know, you're almost 30 or in your thirties in my case, when looking at decor and furniture online really just gets you off. <laughs> um, no, it is It is one of the joys of uh, my time to relax by myself. I love to look at furniture and article.com is my favorite place to go. Uh, the furniture is sleek and modern and simple and so beautifully and thoughtfully designed. And it's affordable, everybody. These are contemporary pieces at fair prices, fast flat rate delivery, which I love. And then if you don't like it, simple returns and exchanges. Article, basically they don't have showrooms, no salespeople, no retail markup. So they really cut out the middleman to save us money. It's the easiest way to buy beautiful modern furniture. And we are just super proud to partner with them. We have pieces in our own homes. I am actually talking to you live from our studio table, which doubles as my kitchen table. And it is a gorgeous glass top with a walnut wooden bottom. I love it. It's super sleek. And then I have a beautiful marble coffee table. Come on, people. I'm an adult. And right now on article.com, they just released their new summer 2019 outdoor furniture. So check it out. Gotta love some outdoor furniture. If you'd like to try article, you can get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more when you visit article.com slash almost 30. So that's article.com slash almost 30 to get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. I feel like I can tell you all anything and I know you'll relate. We've talked about this in the secret Facebook group, but um, you know, a lot of us deal with anxiety and I am one of them as I kind of realize my dreams and make this thing happen with almost 30 with Krista as exciting as it is and as fulfilling as it is, it also stirs up a lot of anxiety. And so I have been using Calm to help me. This is the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. Um, This just helps me to stay focused, to stay present, to reconnect with my breath and just reconnect with what's real. You know, sometimes anxiety can uh, make me spiral and, and imagine things that really aren't the reality of the situation. So Calm has really, really helped me. Um, they even have sleep stories, which are bedtime stories for adults designed to help you relax. So I'll listen to those before I go to bed. But I highly recommend, you know, this is something that you do for just a few minutes a day and it could make such a difference. So why not try it? Um, right now, almost 30 listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash almost 30. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash almost 30. And you will get 25% off a Calm premium subscription. You mentioned God, and I, I'm curious about like your relationship with God or Source, and how that has changed in recovery, and what you see in yourself as that relationship strengthens. Uh, <clears throat> I think for me, most of my life, uh, I was—if there was God, I was mad at Him, and I didn't appreciate. Yeah. And I didn't understand. So um, I, don't, I, I used to not believe in God. You know, like you can't tell me this is all by happenstance. This is all, this is all your plan, sir. Well, yeah. you screwed you fucked up because this is not good. That was my initial reaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and so I was talking to my sponsor about it. We were on step three and we were talking about turning my will and my life over to care of God as I understood him. And how do I understand him? And I started, you know, because of the fact that I knew that if I don't do this thing, right? I'm going to die. So I have the gift of uh, desperation, right? So, okay, now it's real for me. Okay. So let me really look at that. What does God mean to me? And he said something that was really profound to me. He said, well, you, you could just make it a group of drunks, G-O-D, group of drunks. When you're in Alcoholics Anonymous, when you're, I make better decisions when I'm vulnerable with that relationship. 
but it takes a two-way street. So I got to tell everyone how I'm doing. I got to be vulnerable. I got to put the work in. I got to show up. You know, I have to communicate uh, and take advice. And when I'm in that source, like my, I make way better decisions mm-hmm. and my life gets better, you know? And mm-hmm. so for me in the beginning, as of right now, like, group of drunks was all I needed. Good orderly direction. That was tangible for me because God's not really essentially tangible yet for me. That made it real. Oh, so I could put my faith that this worked for them. When I'm here, I make better decisions. That's a higher power than me. It's good enough for me to get started. And you and, spoke about the idea of God as a man as well. Oh, and I, I hate how, like, first of all, even if you know what God is, which you don't, um, it doesn't have a gender. Like, why would God have a gender? Mm. Right? Religions, I think, the only way man can make God tangible. But there's no gender. It's bigger than you realize. If you know what happens when you die, you're a liar, right? If you know what God really is, you're a liar. You have a, maybe your own personal conception of him, but you don't know. Nobody knows. It's bigger than that. And, you know, so that always uh, helped me to just let's focus on what's in front of me and let the seed grow. Yeah, Everyone you know, knows I'm, Jesus is a white man with brown hair. <laughs> right. Right. Of course. Well, Billy, right. you talked it about... It only makes sense. Yeah, well, he, I remember um, you used to talk about you think, you know, traditionally you might think of God as like this man with a white beard or something. Billy was like, I don't like men. <laughs> like, I, I, I didn't. He was oh, really working his relationship with men. I, I don't like And so like for him, men. he was like, no thanks. No yeah, thanks. That was the, la- that was the last thing I wanted was another yeah. man to let me down, yeah. right? And so it was no, no good for me. Uh, but it, and it did. It's not. Yeah. In the Gnostic tradition, it's Sophia. Oh, I'm into that. Universe. Sophia Petrillo? Cool. Yeah, she's like fucking her. amazing, actually. <laughs> she's really, really powerful. Um, and then what has, so as, oh, I just wanted it as the last thing, the ego thing. Ooh. So you with ego. Yes. Like what is, what have you realized as it relates to that? And how are you, and what does processing mean to you? So this ego concept is so new. Like, obviously I've known what ego was, but it's not just ego. Like, you know, I look at the social media space. I'm like, oh my God, we have a national or a world crisis around yeah, ego. Very true. And so I, what I had to start doing was paying attention to my intentions when I did everything, mm. like literally everything. And I will tell you, I am, you know, that feeling where you're like, oh, this is a new concept and I have so much to learn. Yeah. That's how I feel Every right now. So I am my just, life. my toes <laughs> are dipping it. in the ego sands and or waters <laughs> or whatever. Like I have like one toe in maybe. And I know there's so much more for me. It's, it's awareness. So the first thing I have to do is just develop awareness. Every single time I have a thought that says, I am doing this because of oh, wanting to be seen. I hope someone sees me in this car. I hope mm. that um, I want someone to know that I own a business or that I have this Instagram account or that I did this or that. It's like at every choice I make, where is it coming from? And how do I bring it back to service? And so Billy has taught me service is such a big part of his life. Um, and so for me, it's, it's bringing it back, checking my intentions with every single thing I do and reprogramming, totally rewiring the way I live my life to be of service. Yeah, with the, the, the I, when I when you say that, I think of uh, the the argument we got in before all that about um, you mean not posting about our relationship on Instagram. So this is what this is one of those intuitive things, kind of like what you were asking before. Is is I had this really weird gut feeling this one day. It was odd, and it had been probably like Billy was in um, it was in recovery for about two months then, two and yeah. a half months. And I had been with him sort of that whole journey. We've been, you, you know, always, I, you're never I, not I was, with me. we were seeing each other every day. I was supporting him through that. I was keeping him off my social media. So a lot of people I, I assume were probably A, not thinking about us at all, but B, as <laughs> no one's thinking about us as much as we think they are, but B, you know, assuming that we weren't seeing each other or whatever, and we just wanted to keep space. So we weren't on social media with our relationship. So I wanted to make sure that that was sacred. And, but then I I had this weird feeling that it looked like from the outside, as I started sharing like Billy occasionally on mine and him recovering and he was, he started like doing, like being on social media, but I was, I was like never part of it. I was not shown. I was not visible. I was, and I, and I started, my ego started saying, people are going to think that I just did like took this guy on the tour, used him to do the tour and, um, and ditched him at the end. Like that was where my ego went. And, and I brought it up because, and I'm so grateful that we can have those conversations. Mm-hmm. I can say anything to him and we can have that conversation yeah. where usually you want to just be like, I don't want to tell anyone I was thinking that. Um, but it's true. And now I'm telling everyone here. <laughs> but, and, and we talked about it and 
and it was um, conversation and and it's just not, that's not how he lives his life. And I told him, I was like, it's not about you posting something about me. It's, and we were like trying to navigate this. But that night was when I got the message from the girl that said that, oh, so basically this girl who- Oh, I didn't Billy mean to read the story Billy, up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the woman that Billy had been with, um, her friend responded to like one of my quotes of the day and said, you can't be, it, the quote was like, um, you can't, be everything to everyone and nothing for yourself or something. And she wrote, like, you can't be everything to him when he tells the world you're nothing. Which is like, not true. I'm but... like, hmm, that's an interesting yeah. DM. <laughs> yeah, literally. You're like, you I'm have like, a great do I day feed too, into this? <laughs> do I? Did you re- yeah, what did you recall? Quote of the day. Well, this happened like is an there hour another after question? we had this conversation. Oh, wow. <laughs> Billy doesn't want that. Billy, I'm you just, brought I'm, this I'm, up. I'm joking. Anyway, so, so <laughs> moral, of the, moral of the story. <laughs> yeah. Moral of the story. Um, she was just pretty being defensive of her friend who also got her yeah. through this process and who's a wonderful person. And I, I just, you know, I responded and kind of eventually she said, I, I want you to know something, but I don't want, there, my friend doesn't want there to be drama around this. And listen, I'm not the kind of girl that's gonna be like the other, the, it's her fault. I'm like, it's Billy's fault, you know? Mm-hmm. And technically we're not, together, we weren't together. So I, like, where can I get mad? I'm just gonna get yeah. mad and I'm not gonna see, I'm gonna totally throw under the rug and not tell anyone that I was on a dating app at the time. <laughs> like I did nothing wrong. And and so anyway, it went into this whole, this this situation. And my point in saying this is the ego conversation came from that because the truth is like, it was, I took it personally. It had nothing to do with me. Nope. It had nothing to do with me. Mm-mm. And I took it personally. Yeah. So I'm paying attention. It's about right now for me, it's just about awareness. Yeah. Anytime my ego steps in or I take action from ego, I have a thought from ego um, and it's way bigger than I can comprehend right now. So I'm just trying to like grasp onto anything I can yeah. comprehend. Well, I, I think but, what we're realizing is like at the end of all this, all the drama that we went through, all the ups and downs, like there's a reason for it. Yeah, to pay do. attention to why these are happening and mm. to be honest, to communicate like, this is why this happened. This is why it's, so how do we correct it in the future? And then like, that's how life's going to be. Yeah. It's constantly going to have this cycle of things happening. Nothing's perfect. Life's life. Yeah. But how are we reacting to it? Are we going to react together with it? Are we going to be transparent with it? Are we going to learn the lessons of life's pendulum? Mm. Or are we just going to keep feeling it, go back and forth? We've yeah. grown so yeah. much. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But my You're thing like, with that is that doesn't seem ego to me. It seems like an intuitive hit that something no. energy shifted online and you were going to hear something. I felt, no, no, that's no. what I was speaking to. That yeah. was intuition. And it, and I told him later, I said, that conversation about posting, sharing that I've been part of this recovery journey, right. that was my, that was me trying to articulate a feeling I was having. And I did it in a really bad way. Yeah. Like that was, I just didn't it communicate just, it, it. The way you described it to me was very much, well, how come you don't, how can you tell the world that I'm doing this? And it was right. just very ego driven. That's how he like, heard it. And yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's very strange, but it turned out, a good conversation. Yeah, actually. I mean, yeah. It, this it's been one of the most probably growth provoking conversations in our relationship. Wow. And all we had to do is just be honest. Yeah, yeah. and That's I told it. him I was like, "Here's the thing: if you want to hook up with someone else, like, let's talk about it. Maybe I'll want in too. Like, maybe mm-hmm. we can play around a little Yo, bit. You I know, have another like, conversation about <laughs> this relationship. I swear, yeah. I'm almost thirty. Oh, Polyamory yeah. is every single topic yeah. you're yeah. having. Yeah, that, that conversation got oh, real. We had a long. I'm reading that book on True right now. We had a big, and, and we've kind of come back full Who circle. Wrote on True Wednesday, uh, Martin. Okay, uh, but um, Aubrey Marcus's girlfriend Whitney had been talking about it. Um, right. They speak pretty open about yeah. It. So. Yeah. Um, but but truth be told, what they say about these open relationships is, that, first of all, they're not like out there saying everyone should do it. But they say is you don't do it for the sex. You do it because it challenges every bit of ego and personal like feel like it just challenges all of that in you and you grow. Yeah. And so from that perspective, I'm like, okay, I mean, I can get it. But we've kind of come around. We've had so many conversations about it, which has been one of the, and, and I think it's so been so there's so much growth. And we've kind of come around and said, hmm. I don't think that's really what we want, but I'm really glad that we had that right. conversation because what it did is it gave each of us permission to, if if that comes up, to know that we can say it to each other and not freak out. And it doesn't become, it's not this huge thing. Yeah, yeah. It comes down to the, the honesty was the most attractive part of it. Can we be honest with each yeah. other about you want to be with somebody else? Great. I know it's not because you don't love me, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's It's purely physical at that point because there's only one person I'm connected to in life and that's her. Everything else is just physical. We are, our, our connection, I think, feels like it goes deeper than that. Yeah. And that's what I keep sacred. And then, but to be able to talk about these, have these conversations like, ooh, do you like that? Do you not like this? But 
is the honesty for me that was the most attractive yeah. part. Absolutely. I feel like for a lot of men too, it's probably, especially with other women and females and being attracted to women and, you know, potentially having an open relationship or a polyamorous relationship. It's probably so refreshing to be honest about that. Yeah. Oh you God. Know? Yeah. I know with Justin and I, like it's probably been the last year, maybe two years where we've been, I've been able to be like, wow, she's like fine. And yeah. he, could, he nods, he doesn't say anything, but he's able to nod <laughs> yeah. without fear <laughs> and be right. like, and agree. And we can be honest about, you know, being attracted to, you know, other women or, or whatever it is. And it's probably such a mask off and like such a breath of fresh air for a man. Absolutely. I mean, I think most people in life, I think they they step out on relationships or they look, they do all these things because they can't feel that they have the ability to express how I really feel. Or I'm really into this or I really like that. Or you're stuck in this, like, I have to play this part. I can't like that. Yeah. Everyone's going to look at me different. You're going to think I'm weird for wanting it, yeah. but I want to experience it with you, but I'll experience with experience it with her because she approves of it and you don't like yeah. it, but I've never talked to it about it. that whole conversation rabbit hole happens. Yeah. And yeah. women, the the book that are untrue, it's talks all about women's sex drives and this sort of basically like everything that we've been told about sex and our, our like all of that stuff is, like sex at dawn. is not true. Yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. it's like a more feminine sort of approach. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really interesting because I think it uh, oftentimes it's women who want to do that. And, and and what happens is all that happens is we get shame and then lies yeah. come up. Mm-hmm. And so if we could just create spaces in our relationships, whether it's monogamous or consensual non-monogamy or whatever it is, just to have space, to have honest conversations, to know that I know that if I could tell Billy anything, mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean he might not kind of like be really angry or upset right when he hears it or something like that. But for the, I, I really feel like I could tell you anything and yeah. we could have a mindful conversation and it it's would be like number it would one growth. turn on. Oh my right. gosh. You it's know? so hot. It's like when, when you bring up things that might be detrimental to other relationships, but within your relationship, you can communicate like your understanding them of them deepens and therefore you're more attracted to them and mm-hmm. more like, it's just, it seems counterintuitive to a lot of people who haven't had these conversations because yeah. they're like, that would destroy, like he would think this right. of me or whatever. But like to have those conversations, yeah. I mean, anytime a guy is really honest with me, I'm like, oh, yeah. Dude, I'll tell you, you what, know? like we didn't talk for a while. And uh, after the girl thing, uh, we took about a couple of days off and then we're like, fuck it, you know, we're going to talk. Right. So we had a real honest conversation. Uh-oh. She was mad. I was mad. This is this is the truth. You guys were in a mud pit. Oh, but it, 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 it was the most raw conversation ever. And I telling you, it's the best sex we ever had. Like instantly after <laughs> that. That's the truth. You know, but like we went from being yeah. so mad. Yeah. I hate you. This is that. This I'm I'm not dating to like, oh my God, we're we're connected again. Well, it, was was so hot, it was so hot. It was so real. And it was yeah. just it was very just like it was raw. Yeah. And I was just like but that that's what the, that's because we got that. honest and there was no more barrier between us. Yeah. It was just like, I'm mad at you, but I still want to be, you know what I mean? Like they just broke up and she's like, we just had the best sex we've ever had because we were right? so honest and yeah. open and you know, you're not holding back and it's changed so much. And we've all like, we've always been quite honest. I think outside of his recovery and addiction, I think, sure. I don't think he's ever really given me any reason not to trust him ever. Like right. my, so it's hard to explain. It's, it's sort of com- compartmentalized for me is, he, if he says he's going to call, he calls. If he says he's going to show up, he shows up. He does. He's he is so reliable, and you've been like that since day one with addiction because the shame's attached to your height. Like he's he's hidden those things, right? So we've always been like that. But these sorts of layers, these challenges that come into our life like this, where it's so painful. Like I was I was modeling for Old Navy, and every time I went into my dressing room to change outfits, it was like during those like five days we weren't talking. I was like, I am going to start bawling. Like mm. all of this was going on and I have to go out there yeah, and like, like smile. Performance and, police. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Fucking smile. Totally. totally. Wow. And, and so, but it has been the most grow. It has just been one of the most powerful like seasons for us. And the truth is we're not together right now. We don't have a title on us. I'm about to go to Asia for two or three months on my own. And we decided when we come back, when I come back, we'll maybe try and figure something out. But it's like slow, slow motion. We have to go in yeah. slow motion. So I just enjoy being close to her for for the for, for the real for the first time, like really close to her now. Like there's nothing between us at all. No lies, no no secrets. There's just nothing. Huh. And that is like I don't need a label. I have you. Like I'm regardless. You know, no matter what happens in us, if if she chooses to be with somebody else and that makes her happy, genuinely and honestly, I support that 100. percent 
Like, I just want to see her thrive. And the only way I can do that is if I make myself thrive. Uh, and then hopefully we can decide to go together. But no matter what happens, like, she's never not going to be in my life on some level. So yeah. with that, who cares? What else happens? What everything else happens? Who cares? Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Stuff. Love you guys Where so much. Where can people follow you? Where can people uh, find you? So I'm at Danica Bryce Show mm-hmm. on pretty much everything. So just my name. Yeah. Um, and then my business is Model Meals, which is bomb. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We make meals. Best. They're not for <laughs> models. They're for human beings for who like people. to feel good and eat food. Good you food. know who's your biggest fan? Luke Story. I love him. Dude. He's a, a dream. That he reps so hard. Does he? Yeah. He's a man. I know. He we went so over hard. to his place and he was like ordering his model meals. He's like, hold on. <laughs> yeah, on, We were, like, we were 45 minutes late because of me. And he's uh, like, oh God, I can't. He's like, I'm so glad you guys are late. You could have been later. <laughs> <laughs> he literally loves. He's like, no, I think it's so rude when people are on time. <laughs> we were like five minutes and then early. we sat around for like another 45 minutes I love yeah. it so much and Billy oh, you, you were fine oh uh, at culinary Hustler. recovery yeah great uh, <laughs> soon to be starting a new um Website. Bachelorette party business. Okay, can we just Shut throw that out there real quick? Let me tell you about it. So, so I, culinary recovery, we do a lot of like cooking uh, classes and parties and catering, and then we want to change how people in recovery eat and all that kind of good stuff. But so I do a lot of bachelorette parties lately, right? And, and he's hot. Is yeah, he yeah, yeah but, like, topless. Not yeah. yet, but we're thinking about. So I want to start doing that. I, wanna, I have another friend of mine yeah. who is also a really good looking chef. And we're going to create... Oh, are you really good looking? You are. <laughs> you are but you have so to, like, you're I, saying you're really good I have a certain really demographic. Let me just tell you that much. I have a certain demographic. Uh, so you think you're really good looking. Chefendales. Right? Oh my God. Bachelorette parties. Bow tie. Beautiful apron, chef. Nothing else. Yo. Beautiful food. Enjoy your last would you night. Strip? Not married. I would. <laughs> you would. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Right. I'm totally well, okay with that. Like, you, you know, I mean, the price has got to be right. Shit, apron, but... apron only? No, I think we would. I think and we like would... A, but you should get your apron where it's spray, paint, spray painted, like a six pack. <gasps> like a spray painted That's body so apron, dope. but you're yeah. still under, naked underneath. That is underneath. so dope. Yeah, I like that. Because you think about how many like bachelorette parties. Totally. And, like strippers housewives. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Orange want, County. Good looking men to serve you really orange great County. food. Two right? words. Orange County. Yeah. yeah. Dun, dun, mm. <laughs> So anyway, um, if you need us, that's our next project. It's in, it's in the works. Well, we're so proud of you and proud to know you. Uh, ended up with Strippendales. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chef and Dales. Chef and Dales. Oh. Chef okay. and Dales. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you get it? Chef and Dales. I'll explain it to you. I after get it. I get it. Krista. Almost as good as avocado. You're really good yeah. at the... Yeah. We never did that, but ah. it's great. It's so an avocado you got, you got subscription domain, business. Though. I own the domain, so don't you dare try and steal it. Avocado try and buy subscription it. business. Um, avocado. It would be avocados direct to your door, varying ripenesses. I know. Avocado. It'd be cool com. if you like, cracked it open. It was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like a, like yeah, a little, pill bottle? little avocado. Mondays, yeah. On the seed. It was like Mondays. <laughs> oh cool. my God. Right? Like a pill box. So it's like yeah. Mondays. And you're like, oh, this <laughs> one's ripe today. And yeah, then you open perfect. up Tuesdays. You're like, Tuesdays perfect. is ripe on Tuesday. Yeah. As it turns out, it's really hard to, um, oh, I'm sure. to do that sure. to manage, but I'm sure it can be done. Yeah. Wow. Hey, don't mean to stress you out. But. <laughs> yeah, great, guys. But you got Speaking a business space. with calling you. Speaking of space. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I love you guys. We love Thank you. you. Love you guys. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Here. I appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Danica and Billy, for sharing your story for the first time. We are honored. So thank you. Yeah. At Danica Brysha on Instagram. And then Culinary Recovery on Instagram is Billy. And we will see you on tour. Almost30podcast.com events for the dates. Your podcast pro. If you want to start a podcast, we would love to support you. Stay tuned for more news from us. And thank you always for supporting the podcast. It means so much that Lindsay and I are able to do this. Yeah. We just get to be ourselves and hopefully inspire you to do the same. So we will catch you next time. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.